Hello, everyone. A couple of administrative items before we get started. Due to the large number of attendees, we will be muting everybody's microphone during the session. You can type in questions in the questions pane located in the control panel. I'll answer some questions at the end of the session. Also, feel free to send us comments or questions about the webinar to webinars at csiamerica.com. Also, the webinars will be recorded on our website. Okay, so let's get started. All right, in this example, I'll be applying auto lateral seismic loads to a structure based on the ASCE 716 code. We'll discuss the differences between load application when using a rigid diaphragm versus a semi rigid diaphragm. Then I'll define a seismic load pattern and going through each one of the parameters in depth. We'll run an analysis and take a look at some output, including story response plots, a summary report and modal mass participation tables. Okay, so here's the model we're using here. Let's take a look at it in depth. We can rotate this around. You can see it's a six story structure. It has a penthouse located on the top and some unique geometry located on the first floor. So first thing we'll do is define some diaphragms and then assign them to the structure. So under the define menu, we'll take a look at diaphragms. Let's quickly unlock the model. One second here. Okay, so we have a rigid and semi-rigid diaphragm. Uh, rigid diaphragms have infam, infamate, infinite in-plane stiffness and doesn't exhibit membrane deformation. All of these loads will be applied directly to the center of mass, same as the wind loads. When using a semi-rigid diaphragm, it's a little different. It simulates actual in-plane stiffness properties and behavior. Uh, loads are applied to every joint that has mass. Now that's different than the wind load application, uh, which was applied to 10 different points along the perimeter of the building. So in this first uh, example, we'll go ahead and use a rigid diaphragm. So then to assign a rigid diaphragm to the structure, we'll go to, first you need to select all the floor elements. So we'll go to select object type, and we're gonna select all the floors. Now you'll notice here in the bottom left-hand portion of the screen, it has all the number of shells listed as 19. So all the floors have been selected. It's kind of a bookkeeping system to show you exactly what you've selected prior to applying uh, any assignments. So once the floors are selected, we'll go ahead and assign shell diaphragms. We'll select rigid diaphragm and click apply. And you'll notice in plan view on the right hand portion of the screen, this kind of spider web image is being shown, showing you that the diaphragm has been assigned to each one of the levels and we can use these arrow buttons here to step down each plan view, each level, to see that the diaphragm has been assigned. Okay. So let's go ahead and define a seismic load pattern. To do that, we'll go underneath the define menu and select load pattern. So I've we can define a seismic load and you can select the different type. 
It's important to select the correct type when defining these load patterns because ETABs will automatically generate load combinations for you and the associated scale factors. So you can see all the different types of loads that can be defined. Seismic, we'll use this one and we'll specify a seismic code. But there's also seismic drift. That's a common question that I get asked. What's the difference between the two? Well, seismic drift, the same code options are available as defined for the seismic loads, but this option does not enforce certain upper limits on the period, resulting in a lower base shear and deflections when checking drift limits. So for this example, we'll check uh, seismic type. And these are all the different auto lateral load codes that are included here in ETABs. You can see lots of international codes, uh, older domestic codes are available. For this example, we'll use ASCE 716. Okay, so the first portion we'll discuss is the direction and eccentricity. Now you'll notice when defining a seismic load pattern, you can include X and Y direction loading as well as plus and minus eccentricity all in a single load pattern. Um, in previous versions of ETABs, you would have to define these load patterns individually, creating six different load patterns. Now you can all have these all included in one specific load pattern. Uh, eccentricity ratio for all diaphragms. 5% is the default and eccentricity options have only meaning when diaphragms have been assigned to the structure. Uh, the program ignores all eccentricities when diaphragms are not present. So in this case, we have a default of 5% that will be applied to all diaphragms. Um, when diaphragms are present in the program, it calculates a maximum width of the diaphragm perpendicular to the direction of the seismic loading. The width is calculated by finding the maximum and minimum X and Y coordinates of the joints that are part of the diaphragm constraint and determines the distance between the maximum and minimum values. So that's how it actually uh, calculates, use that value uh, to calculate the lateral loading put upon the diaphragm itself. You have the ability to uh, select uh, different stories and apply specific eccentricities to a specific story. Now you'll notice a different in versus um, older versions of ETABs. This used to be a percentage. Now it's an actual length that needs to be applied. Uh, we'll leave this option alone for this specific model and use the 5% eccentricity uh, as a default. Okay, a time period, there are three different options available to the user, approximate, a program calculated, as well as user defined. Uh, I wanna bring up a table to discuss this option. Okay, you'll notice here, I'm pulling up the lateral loads manual, uh, section 215, which discusses all these options in great detail. Um, you can use the uh, CT values and X values are all user input, uh, as well as the H sub N value uh, for the in input of story level heights. This is the typical range uh, of the CT values which are used, uh, as well as the X varies from 0.75 to 0.9. So you can enter in all these values directly uh, to use the approximate period method. Now, the differences between the two is when you use program calculated, um, the program starts with the period of the mode calculated to have the largest participation factor in that direction. So program calculates the coefficient upper limit uh, for CU and the building period T chooses from uh, each of these next two equations. We'll go to the next page here and zoom in. So, if T mode is less than CUTA, then that T mode value is used. And you can see the situation where uh, if T mode is greater than CUTA, then the CUTA value is used directly. So those are the determinations between the two equations 
uh, to see which time period is used. Uh, for user defined, of course, then you can actually uh, input the building period manually uh, as well. Okay, uh, let's talk about story range. This is this is interesting. So I have a penthouse level uh, on this example. I mean, for most interests, most instances, you can specify the top story as the upper level in the building, typically, which would be the roof. But in some cases, like it's this one, a lower level may be chosen. For example, I have uh, this penthouse roof. Um, is included in the model, it may be best to calculate the automatic ladder load based on the roof level, excluding the penthouse as the top story. And then you could add in uh, additional user-defined loads to account for the penthouse. So why don't we do that in this, in this example? So we'll set the top story for seismic loads as roof. Now, for the bottom level, which would be typically the base level, however, like an Unlike in this example, a building could have several below grade levels. Um, so in that case, it may be best to specify the bottom story uh, to be above the base of the building. So this, this specific model does not have any um, subgrade levels. So we'll leave the bottom story as base. Okay. We have some seismic coefficients that can be defined. SS is the mapped targeted maximum considered earthquake spectral acceleration uh, for all short periods. And S1 is the mapped spectral acceleration for a one second period. Um, all these values uh, can be obtained from the USGS map access, access from their website. So you can enter, these, enter in these values manually. And you'll notice once I change the site class, uh, the site coefficients for FA and FV are changed automatically as well. So once these input values are entered up here, you can select your site class and the calculated coefficients are shown here below. Okay, so now we've taken the time to define all the parameters in the seismic loading. We'll click OK. Now, why don't we go ahead and run an analysis? Because there's lots of output we can take a look at. I'll quickly, quickly run this analysis. And what we'll look at are the loads on the structure that have been applied uh, for the seismic loading uh, for both for two instances uh, for a rigid diaphragm and then we'll take a look at when a semi-rigid diaphragm is assigned to the structure i have a separate model for that okay so if we take a look at the deflected shape i'll select seismic now you'll notice it's a step number here, and I can step through all the six different um, lateral loads that have been applied in the X direction, Y direction, and the plus and minus eccentricities are all included in a single load pattern. So if I take a look at this, and I could step through each one of these, on the bottom right hand portion of the screen, you can use these arrows to step through each one of these um, the seismic steps. Okay, now if we want to take a look at the loads that have been applied to the structure, now remember we are using a rigid diaphragm in this example. We can go to display load assigns, joint. Oh, actually it's shell because we applied the rigid diaphragm to a shell element. Oh, 
Okay. My mistake. It's uh, applied as a joint load. So we can take a look at each one of the different SICK seismic steps that have been calculated and take a look at how the loads are applied to the structure. So on the right hand side of the screen, remember I said when you're using a rigid diaphragm, um, it is applied to the center of mass. So if we step down each one of these floors, you can see that a large, let's go to the roof level here, 198 kips has been applied to the center of mass on the roof level. Here is a uh, sixth floor. You can step down to see the specific values. Now there's a few different ways to view output in ETABs. You can graphically view the loads on the screen as I've shown here. We can take a look at story response plots as well as summary reports. So under display, we talked about deformed shape. Let's take a look at some story response plots. So the, it's right now it's showing the maximum story displacement. Let's take a look at a seismic load, maximum story displacement. We can also take a look at lateral loads uh, to the stories themselves. So here's a nice graphic showing you the lateral load magnitude that's been applied to each one of the stories. We have maximum story displacement, uh, story shears, as well as uh, story stiffness. So lots of information can be displayed graphically uh, using the response plots here in ETABS. Another way to view output is to take a look at the reports, which can be generated here uh, in the model explorer. So if I simply right click on the project report, modify report, this is a very powerful tool in ETABS. It allows the user to pick and choose exactly what they wish to view in their report. So in this case, I'm looking at, um, his, these are just some of the general settings where you can select the load cases, load patterns and combinations. Uh, but what I'm interested in is taking a look at the auto seismic loads and the auto seismic calculations. This will show you the equations used in calculating the lateral loads to each one of the stories. Many different options available here as well for output, including centers of rigidity, a diaphragm, a center of mass displacements, and diaphragm drifts. I want to make sure the participate, mass participation ratios are selected and the factors. So now once all of these items have been selected correctly, we can click create. And it will generate a nice summary report so we can take a look at some more output. Okay, this takes a second to load here. Here is the ETABS uh, version 18, 18 project report. Um, let's take a look at how the lateral loads were calculated. We scroll down here to load patterns. We can click on auto seismic calculation. I'll make this a little bigger so everybody can see. And we'll zoom in. So it's showing me all the different equations uh, that are used, all the factors that were uh, used as well. Seismic response, equivalent lateral forces. Here's the calculated base shear, uh, the period used. I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, how it selected this one uh, based upon the mass participation ratios. But you can see here, here are the lateral loads, uh, the weight of the structure, excuse me, uh, as well as the base shear. And if I scroll down a little more, you can see here are the, a similar graph showing the lateral loads applied to each one of the stories in both the X and Y direction. And a graphical format, also in a, a, a tab, tabular format below showing you um, the elevation as well as the magnitude of the loads.
Okay, let's take a look at the modal mass participation ratios. And then we'll take a look at some mode shapes of the structure as well. Actually, why don't we do that first? Uh, I'm gonna go back to display uh, deformed shape. I've shown you the uh, deflected shape for the seismic loading, but also there's also options to uh, view mode shapes. So if I click on apply here, you can step through the different mode shapes in a similar fashion to how you view the deflected shape as well. And I can just step through each one of these. Mode one, you can show it's a, a period of 1.2. Uh, mode two has a uh, period of 1.015 seconds. And I'll do, we'll just look at the first three because those are the pertinent ones. And you can see how the deflected shape is being shown. I'll animate this here for a second. So while this is animating, um, next I'm going to show you in a tabular format the modal mass participation ratios and how ETAB selected the specific period to be used in the calculation of the lateral loads. Okay, so now you see a nice deflected shape uh, being animated here on the left side of the screen. So if we go back to the report that was generated, I'll click on the modal results here on the left-hand side, uh, modal mass uh, participation ratios. Now I'll make this, hopefully you guys can see that. So for mode one, oh, actually I'm gonna go down a little bit here. For mode one, you can see, it's, we're, we're looking for the maximum value in, for the UX here. So in this case, uh, it's 0.5592. Because this is the maximum, um, this period has been used for the calculation of the lateral loads in the X direction. Similarly, for the Y direction, this U, by, this U value of UI value of 0.556 is the highest. Therefore, this 1.015 uh, second period has been used for the lateral load calculations in the Y direction. So if we just go back up here and check that, we can go back to auto seismic load calculation. And down here, it shows you the period used, 1.06 in the X direction, excuse me, 1.006 in the X direction, and then 1.015 in the Y. Okay. Okay. So why don't we, Take a look at some questions here. Uh, one of the questions here uh, How come we do not need to define a different load pattern for each seismic load direction and eccentricity? So, if I, let's go back to that. If I go to define uh, load patterns, in previous versions of ETABs, yes, you definitely needed to do that. But now with this new option, if under load patterns, I just wanted to unlock the model, uh, modify loads. You can see you have the ability to pick and choose. Uh, you can check on these boxes here, X direction, Y direction, plus and minus eccentricity. You can select these and each one of them will be included in the analysis. So because of this new feature here, you do not have to go back and define a individual load pattern for each one of these uh, because of this new option here. I think this has been available in the last version of ETABS too. Uh, going back to define one individually is not a necessity anymore. There's a question about, can we assign diaphragms by nodes? Uh, yes, you can. So let me show you how to do that. If I just go, let's see, this model has been unlocked. So you'll notice here, if I just, I'll just select um, all the nodes on this one specific floor. 
I can go to assign joint uh, diaphragms. So there is an option uh, to define the diaphragms by shells as well as joints. So that option is also available here uh, in the ETABs. Uh, there's a question about if the if we can access the recorded video of this session. Uh, yes. So after this session is over, um, all of these videos are going to be posted uh, to a website, and we'll email a link to each one of the attendees here today uh, to access uh, all the videos. Not only this one, but all future videos as well. Okay, there's a question about uh, what is eccentricity in seismic loading? Uh, if I go to define, let's go back to that uh, load pattern definition. So here is the eccentricity ratio of, of 5%. Uh, so this is the default. 5% um, is going to be assigned to each one of the, uh, the diaphragms. And it's only going to be assigned when the diaphragms have been assigned to the structure. Um, so after the appropriate diaphragm uh, width is determined, in this case, the 5%, um, the program applies a moment that is equal to the specified percent eccentricity um, times the maximum width of the diaphragm perpendicular to the direction of the seismic loading. Um, so that is, this is a percentage of the width. Uh, that's used in calculation. But remember, if you use an overwrite eccentricity here, this is not a percentage. This is an actual length um, that needs to be input in this uh, dialog box. OK. Um, any further questions, uh, please feel free to send to webinars at csiamerica.com. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Please check our website uh, for further webinars on different topics. And again, uh, each one of these webinars that will be recorded and posted on our website. Uh, thank you very much.